Welcome to our first episode of Soil Optics Tech Talks, uh, working with Crop Care Consulting and Trevor Thornton here from Western Canada. And he's going to be walking through sort of an intro to soil optics technology. Uh, this is the first part, um, which will be introducing kind of the field operations standpoint. And we'll be getting into part two, which will be coming out here shortly as well. So I'm going to pass it over to Trevor to take us through intro to soil optics. Thanks, Zach. Um, thanks for uh taking some interest in even watching our, our videos for uh, soil optics. So like Zach said, I'm Trevor Thornton. Uh, we're the Western Canadian distributor and supplier for West uh, for soil optics. <laughs> Today, we're just going to go through kind of an intro and background, a little bit of the soil optics to kind of get partway through the process. Uh, in part two, we're going to dive more into the map side of it and, um, you know, allow you to split it up a little bit so it's not as uh, time consuming for you so you can watch them pretty quick. So let's... Uh, Let's dive in. So about me, I've been 19 years an independent consultant. We've been doing variable rate for 19 years. Um, five and a half years of soil optics coming this spring. We'll be starting our sixth year with uh, soil optics. So we're pretty excited about that. We saw a presentation um, at a, a precision ag show the winter of 2016, and, and it really intrigued us what they're talking about on the soil optics. So through a lot of discussion with the folks at soil optics at the time, uh, we had a sensor to try in the spring of 2016. We were impressed enough with what we saw and with what we showed to our growers that we owned a sensor for the fall of 2016. Now we're mapping with three sensors from Thunder Bay to Peace River in uh, Western Canada and Northwest Ontario. Uh, potentially this spring, certainly next fall, we're heading into the BC region as well. So again, excited about adding these new territories and areas. So you can see just a map of where we've, uh, where we've dropped the sensor um, and, and mapped some fields in Western Canada. Um, this spring, we're very fortunate. We're going to have the opportunity to start doing some mapping down in this area of, uh, of Saskatchewan. So uh, we've got a good coverage. We've got a lot of maps. We can just about show anybody in Western Canada what maps from their area or close to their area would look like. So we got a good broad spectrum of, of examples to use. So what is soil optics? Soil optics is a pre-calibrated geological instrument. It comes out of the geology world. And why is that important? Well, because... We are measuring gamma radiation, and they use that a lot in the geological world to trace minerals, to trace um, rock outcroppings, but this one's specifically calibrated for agriculture. So we're measuring the Earth's naturally occurring geological energy. Um, very specifically, we're, we're measuring cesium, thorium, uranium, and potassium. And the reason that those nucleotides were chosen is because they're very stable, and they don't change a lot over time. So we don't need to go in every year or every two or three or five years even to remap a field. Once it's mapped, we have that, that uh, raw data that we can move forward with. So we're talking about the repeatability of the data over time. And you can see between these two images, they're very closely related as far as their, their um, colors, which is being represented by the total count in the background. The thing is, is these images or, or these maps were sensed six months apart over winter. Uh, we have a fertilizer application that went on, so you can see the fertilizer applications do not change the sensor data, and it was a different sensor, and each sensor kind of has its own unique personality. So although the raw numbers might be different, the patterns in the field are identical, which shows us the stability in the sensors that we can use them, um, repeatability to, uh, to recalibrate fields in the future. A little bit of soil optics history, this is just kind of where they came from, uh, just so you're aware. In 2013, research started on gamma use in agriculture. In 2009, the Raymers started practical precision in Ontario. Uh, they discovered the soil optics technology in 2010 and started doing their own research in North America. 2013, they started offering it as a soil optics service. In 2017, they officially separated the soil optics service out of the practical precision umbrella. So it's a standalone uh, op op company now. And then here we are in 2021 with, um, you know, they've got sensors all over the world and growing. Um, plus, you know, we're, we're we've, uh, you know, growing what we're doing in Western Canada as well. So we look at the soil optics process and what that's all about. It all starts with the survey. So the sensor is a non-contact pre-calibrated passive sensor. And by passive, meaning think of it as a sponge. It receives data. It sponges that data up. When you look at other competing sensors in the marketplace, they're all active sensors, meaning they need to send a signal out and get a signal back. So our chances of, of um, gathering uh, poor data or, or having something 
um, interfere with that data collection is is reduced significantly. Uh, you mount it on on the front or the back or wherever you want on a collection vehicle about two feet above the ground, basically start driving. For best results, about 12 mile an hour um, is, is your top end speed, although we have done some diligence and do, done some different settings with our system. Our system, we can travel a little bit faster. And then as you're driving, the sensor's dropping a point about every three to five feet and we're traveling about every 40 foot on the field. We do have some fields that we've gone narrower because of the extreme variability in them, but for the most part, the 40 foot seems to work really well. So these are just some samples of some collection vehicles that the soil optics crew has around uh, North America. Uh, so you can see the sensor mounted on the back of these two vehicles on the front of this gator over here. And the GPS is put on top of that sensor. So we want that to correlate very strongly to GPS location and where those uh, points are being logged. Uh, this is a picture of our first optics unit. Uh, this is the sensor right here. This is a little bit, bit bigger one um, than, than the ones that they have now. So we're able to mount it just a hair higher with our RTK survey grade GPS. Mapping some, uh, some fields in uh, Thunder Bay on top of snow so you can see the moisture from the snow uh, in the fall doesn't affect the sensor readings at all. Then we decided to add uh, a Jeep into our system after seeing what the soil optics folks in Ontario were doing. Uh, it worked great from transport between the vehicles, very comfortable going back and forth, but it did leave some marks in the field. And we had a few growers not complain about it, but make some comments. So we wanted to look at other options, but we do still have it in the fleet as an option. So in the cab, we have uh, one computer mapping the soil optics data that's coming off the sensor. We have another one that's doing a backup logging of the elevation. Uh, we have a Trimble 250 that we use for SWAT guidance, not auto steer, but SWAT guidance, and then an iPad in there to uh, that we use to log the boundaries and or uh, log our soil points when we're done um, mapping the field and start the, the soil sampling process. So we tried uh, and rented a uh, big Defender cab in the fall of, I don't even remember which fall it was now with COVID, I'm all kind of mixed up. Um, but here's here's that sensor, and I'm glad we had it for this year because winter kind of set in on us, so it did keep us keep us nice and warm. But it was a very expensive venture. Uh, so what we've moved to now is Maverick Trails. They're a small, compact unit, uh, very comfortable to sit in. They have heaters inside. Uh, we can open up the windows and and get some fresh air through. And they leave uh, hardly a track in the field. Most growers don't even know we've been in their field. So we've eliminated that uh, that uh, the the tracks that growers were concerned about. Um, because it's so small and light, we can get closer to areas where they might be wet. Uh, certainly traveling over some peat bogs, our, our likelihood of getting stuck is now slim to none. And, and it works really well, and it's kind of more of an affordable thing to go uh, in our system. Uh, earlier, I mentioned looking at RTK survey grade elevation. Well, this is some RTK elevation from a popular VR company that's out there, and you can see every pass in the field. And when we processed another field for the same grower who uh, shared his data, and uh, presented him with it. He says, my land's not terraced. We said, well, we know, but when you're using a subpar uh, RTK uh, system, you're not going to get good good elevation. So be careful what you're paying for out there. Then he says, well, I got VRS. So I'm gonna you know, send you that data from my combine and let's see what it does. And this is a sample of one field. Um, this would be somewhere in the middle of, of the quality of data that we got. Some fields were worked out not too bad. Some fields were worse than this but it's really not elevation data that we can use to do anything with. So uh, again, you got to start with good quality data. And again, I guess back to that old saying, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So you got to be careful on, on what you're doing. So what you're seeing here is a picture of the raw data that we see in the buggy when we're traveling the field. Uh, you see that it ranges from a red to a blue with yellows in the middle, and that's a strong correlation to what you're getting in the background for the soil. So the blue areas of the field usually mean lower CEC, sandier, lower organic matter. Your red areas are the exact opposite of that. So they're higher clay content, higher CEC, and higher organic matter. So when you see, you know, depending on the field, it ranges quite a bit. There is no optimum map and optimum picture, um, and we don't pre-class anything we go to the field. Each field has its own unique personality, and that's what we're trying to gather. We're trying to measure the differences and where those differences change in that field, and then quantify that back with soil samples. So here's a picture of a field that we mapped in Alberta. Again, you can see the reds um, being a heavier soil, the blues for this field being the lighter texture, and then a color version of the topography map on that field. Uh, we also map out some high spots and low spots and drainage ditches. So if we ever want to do tile drainage, uh, surface drainage, or land leveling, 
we have good quality data in the background that can be used so you don't have to resurvey your field again. The sampling side of it, the sensor itself doesn't tell you what's going on with the soil uh, data, just tells you where the transitions are. So we need soil samples to calibrate those numbers back. Uh, we've kind of westernized the process. We pull a sample about every five to seven acres, depending on the field size, because it gives us better quality maps. We're not sure if that's because of we have more variability or what's going on, um, but we did need to, to tighten up the sampling pattern to what soil optics wanted us to do. But with the technology that we're able to um, uh, gain in advancements with what the soil optics folks have invested in and some of the, the people that they've invested in, the, the processing of the maps is getting better and better. So there's an opportunity for us to potentially look at spreading out those samples again. And then what's the projects that we're starting on now to see if we can spread the samples out. Uh, and then if we can do that, we can save a little bit of money and then pass that on to the growers. So just some pictures of us uh, sampling in the field. Uh, this is in Western Canada and this is uh, on some uh, hayland and grassland in, uh, in Ontario. So the sampling point selection is pretty important because we're wanting to display the, the changes in that field. So we look at the total count map. We consider the topography when we're choosing our sample locations. We look at the stubble and the color of that stubble because that usually tells you what's going on in the background and how that correlates back. And then of course, if the field has been worked or it's a low residue crop, we can look at the soil color because you can see those changes as you're going across the field. Uh, so just this picture of that one same field. Now this is the processed version of the total count map and you can see uh, the soil points. So here we got a couple of points that are pretty close together. And then we've got this area here where we, we don't have a point uh, in the middle and we didn't feel we, we needed it. And when you look at that uh, over 3D, you can see that uh, some, point, some points are top of the hills, some are on side hills, some are at the bottom uh, of the low areas of the field, just kind of whatever suits that field best because we want that to display, uh, we want to measure the changes in that field and do the best job that we can when we're doing our sampling. So here's a picture of that same field I showed you earlier, but we're going to focus in on four plants. Uh, this field was seeded to fall rye when we sampled it, and it was really neat to see that correlation between what the soil optics was reading for a, a sensor reading to what the crop was displaying. So if we look at those these four pictures in these four spots, point one was a yellow spot, uh, so that would be kind of in the middle of your spectrum, and you can see the crop looks not bad, and the soil has a little bit of color to it. We get to point two, which is a light blue, so it should be a little sandier. You can see the crop wasn't doing quite as good, but it's not bad. And you can see in the background, the soil is a little lighter in color. We get to point three, which is a red spot. You can see now that the crop is, is thriving and doing quite well. And you know, through, through the little bit of weeds that are there in the crop, you can see the soil color. So we got a lot of black in there, so higher organic matter. Versus point five, which was a dark blue spot. So that means we're in, on the lighter texture of the field. And you can see, you know, there's, there's a, a fair amount of sand in these spots. And you can see also that the crop is not doing very well in thriving. So to make these correlations gave us a lot of confidence in what we're seeing uh, with the quality of the soil optics mapping data. And then the magic. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on this at all, really, but the magic happens once we get the samples back from the lab and uh, the mapping uh, from the field. We send this all to soil optics and they basically take all that information and put it together to get it back to us. Now, this is where we're going to break for part one. Uh, in part two, we're going to dive into what the maps look like and show some field examples, explain a little bit more about the soil optics. So um, with that, we'll, we'll call an end to part one of our tech talk. If you have any questions or want to learn anything, by all means, reach out to myself or the folks at Soil Optics. We'd be more than happy to uh, help you out in any way possible. With that, I'll turn it back to Zach. Alrighty, thank you so much, Trevor, uh, on giving us a, an introduction to soil optics and, and ultimately what your process is out west. Um, as you say, you, you have westernized the, the process, certainly, uh, that matches a little bit more, obviously, to the, the variability that we do see in, in Western Canadian fields. Um, so this is a, a great first video on introducing the technology to, uh, to anyone that is interested uh, in learning more. Um, and be on the lookout for part two of Intro to Soil Optics uh, brought to you by uh, Crop Care Consulting. And this has been the first episode of Soil Optics Tech Talks. Thank you. Thank you.